Hi everyone, my name is Thomas Sharon. I'm a user experience researcher. And I'm very happy to introduce you to Guy Winch, a psychologist, who's gonna talk about complaint psychology. If you really want his book, The Squeaky Wheel, and you didn't get it, please let the authors at Google team know and we'll purchase books for you. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Am I on? Yes, excellent, all right. So, welcome everyone, and um, thanks for having me, Tomer. Today, I'm going to tell you how our complaining psychology affects our lives and our relationships. Now, I know the topic of complaints is not one that elicits positive connotations for most people, but I really hope to change that. Case in point, I want to tell you about the day my book came out. Like most writers, I dreamed for years about the day I will be able to see a book I wrote on the shelves of a bookstore. So the day my book was published, I ran down to my local bookstore with my favorite pen in hand because my agent said, oh, they're going to ask you to sign books. So I had my pen, I ran up to the customer service desk where the customer service manager was standing and I said, I'm Guy Winch and my book just came out. And she said, Winch, oh, let me see. And she looked it up and she goes, oh, here it is, the squeaky wheel, complaining. Oh, I hate people who complain. Ugh! And she turned away. I realized I won't be needing my pen. But I took comfort in the fact that if she hates people who complain that much, she must really love her job as a customer service manager. <laughs> but I also understood how she felt. We complain more today than ever before in history. We complain about everything from the weightiest global issues to the smallest details of our daily lives. We complain about the actions of our favorite television characters with the same immediacy and passion as we do about the actions of our spouse or our friends. And yet, even our best complainers, our quetching prodigies, even the cream of our moaning crop rarely get the results they want. Today, we are all squeaky wheels, but we don't get the grease. We face daily frustrations and irritations, and we don't have a clue about how to address them effectively. Now, I can see your faces, and I know what some of you are thinking. But let me ask you this. The last time your partner, or your roommate, or your colleague did something that really annoyed you, did you say something to them about it? If you did, did you get the result you wanted? The last time a salesperson was rude to you in a store, did you speak to the manager? The last time the dish you ordered in a restaurant was not cooked properly, did you send it back? Complaints are a much bigger factor in our lives than we realize, and not just because we have so many of them, but mostly because of what happens to us psychologically when we do. The thing is, the urge to complain triggers a powerful and negative psychological mindset that impacts our feelings and our behaviors and, dramatic and dramatically affects our lives and our relationships for the worse, and we don't even realize that is happening. Now, when a psychologist tells you that the mere urge to complain triggers powerful, hidden, destructive forces inside your mind, I understand that can sound like pure theory. <laughs> so the first topic I'll cover today is what the research tells us about complaining psychology. I'll explain what this mindset does to us and what our complaining psychology is costing us in various aspects of our lives. Then I'll tell you what you can do about it. I'll give you the recipe for preparing a complaint sandwich and I'll tell you how to eat one as well. 
Google recently opened a new call center. So we'll talk about the challenges those folks might be, ch might be facing, and we'll end with an inspiring story about extra-large braziers and their occupants. Hopefully, by the end of today, I'll have changed your minds about complaints so you can see them for the opportunities they truly are. But let's begin with the research. And here we see the first gap between what we perceive we do and what we actually do. Most people think they would speak up if they were on the losing end of a bad deal. If something you purchased arrived in the wrong size, if it was broken, if it didn't do what it was supposed to do, most of us think we would complain. And yet, study after study demonstrates that when we are dissatisfied with certain purchases, 95% of us fail to complain to the company in question. 95%. Only 5% of us speak up to the company. And when we ask people why they haven't spoken up in these situations, this is what they say. Here's how we justify why we don't complain. We believe complaining to the company will require too much time and effort. We believe the process of complaining will be too annoying and aggravating. We believe that even if we did complain, we won't get a satisfying result. Now, these might seem like compelling arguments, except for one thing. Those very same people will then relay their tale of consumer woe to an average of 16 friends and acquaintances. And getting re-aggravated every time they do it, expending incredible time and effort in doing it, and resolving nothing. So, do you see the paradox? We voice our complaints to everyone, except the people who can actually resolve them. This same contradiction operates in every sphere of our lives. When we feel hurt or annoyed or disappointed by something our partners or our friends or our family members did or said, we usually don't voice complaints to them for all the same reasons. We believe it will require hours of talking and discussion. We believe doing so will be too aggravating because it will lead to an argument. And we believe that even if we tried complaining to these people, it won't resolve the matter to our satisfaction. In other words, we use the very same reasons to justify why we don't complain in our personal lives as we do in our lives as consumers. And here's the other similarity. Instead of complaining directly to our family members or our friends or our colleagues when we're upset with them, we complain about them to our other family members, our other friends, and our other colleagues. I mean, let's be honest. Locker room acquaintances are more likely to hear what your spouse did to annoy you than your actual spouse. Now, sadly, all this effort in complaining to everyone doesn't work. And what it does do is convince us that, well, complaining doesn't work, so why try? And then the next time we're upset with something, we're even less likely to voice it to the people who can fix it for us. This is a textbook example of a self-defeating prophecy, and we all do it. But perhaps the best illustration of how broken our complaining psychology truly is is the global phenomenon known as complaints choirs. This is the Chicago choir. But all, all over the world, people are gathering in town squares and concert halls to sing their complaints to originally composed music, at times accompanied by symphony orchestras. I wish I was kidding. I'm not. You can look them up on YouTube. There are many of them with hundreds of thousands of page views. Now, you c here's, for example, is St. Petersburg Complaints Choir in Russia. Here is the Tokyo Complaints Choir. Here is the Cairo Complaints Choir, albeit before the uprising. I'm not sure they're singing currently. There are many, many others. Now, since this phenomenon was a Finnish invention, here's the Helsinki Complaints Choir. The Helsinki Complaints Choir has two main complaints. 
Their first complaint is that their trams, their public transportation systems, smell like urine. And their second complaint is they don't get laid enough. Well, maybe they shouldn't take the trams to their dates. Do you know what I'm saying? But here's why this phenomenon is so tragic. Think of how many hours uh, go into preparing the concerts and the lyrics and the composing and the matching outfits. If the Helsinki Choir stood outside their city hall and sang to their politicians, if you don't clean up our trams, we won't vote for you, someone would clean their trams. But they don't do that. None of the choirs do. They have this amazing platform, and none of the choirs use it to actually try and fix the things they're singing about. None of them. So they sing in town squares and their concert halls, and it's all very funny, but nothing changes. By the way, I recently mentioned the Helsinki Choir in a keynote address I gave a few weeks ago because I thought, if I mentioned one of the American choirs, there's the Chicago and Philadelphia and Memphis and others, I didn't want to offend anyone in the audience. So I did Helsinki, and the minute I finished my talk, a woman marches up to me and she goes, I'm from Helsinki. <laughs> so that's awkward. And then she says to me, Helsinki is a great city. It's where they made angry birds. <laughs> And I'm thinking, angry, but that's the best she had. I mean, Helsinki, <laughs> Helsinki is lovely. It's got far more going for it than Angry Birds. But the thing about Angry Birds is, Angry Birds don't call each other up and go, can you believe what those pigs did? They stole my eggs. Why, I'm just fuming about it. They don't. Angry Birds take action. <laughs> they, they, they launch themselves at those pigs. Angry Birds in Helsinki get stuff done. Angry people, not so much. It's true, you don't see choir members launching themselves into the air. You don't see the choir members smashing into the trams. By the way, I should point out, no actual choir members were hurt during the preparation of these slides. The thing is, the mindset we bring to complaining situations is broken. We have a fundamental apprehension about complaining, we have a deep-seated belief that we will not be heard. We feel helpless and powerless about being able to get results, and so we don't even try to complain effectively. But because we have so many complaints, how we deal, or rather not deal with them, can have a real impact on our lives. And the evidence for that is all around us. In terms of results, most of us have a shelf in our closet or our garage, where we put all the purchases that arrived in the wrong size or that were missing a crucial piece that we were going to return, but we never quite got around to making the call. I call it the shelf of complaining shame, frankly. But some people have clothing and programs and electronics, hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of products on that shelf. Most people have pet peeves, for example, about their partners things their loved ones do that drive them absolutely crazy. Sexual behaviors that can be distracting, uh, distracting, or relationship habits that can be really hurtful, or personal habits that can be slightly revolting. Now, we don't know how to complain about this stuff and the more important stuff. And the thing is that those kinds of things can really erode our feelings over time and hasten and bring about the end of our relationships. In our communities, most of our neighbors are upset about the same things we are. They also think there should be a traffic light on that corner. They also find it annoying to arrive for their doctor's appointment on time and then spend over an hour in the waiting room anyway. They also get annoyed where the local grocery store doesn't take expired products off their shelves. But no one speak up, uh, speaks up about those things. I mean, have you ever spoken up about such things? We don't feel we can do anything about these situations, about these small and not so small irritations when they happen. But walking around feeling defeated and upset and powerless on a regular basis affects our mood and it affects our self-esteem and it can even affect our mental health. But if we knew how to complain effectively, 
if we had the tools, if we mastered the techniques, that could get us results. If we had confidence in our complaining ability, we could turn all those problems around. And doing so would improve our quality of lives in so many different ways. For example, currently only 1% of our complaints reach company executives, reach the actual decision makers who can change things. So that's why things don't change. But if we complained more effectively and they knew about it, they would improve products, they would improve services, they would improve their procedures, all things we would gain from. Our relationships would become stronger and more satisfying and longer lasting. We know from research that couples that are able to discuss a complaint productively have much higher marital satisfaction and much longer marital longevity than couples who do not. It's a really huge thing in relationships. Our, relation, our communities would function more smoothly and do better for us. For example, I'm sure some of you know this, but when women spoke out about having to wait twice as long for bathrooms than men in sporting arenas and concert halls, places like New York City passed the Potty Parity Bill. Have you heard of it? Well, great, some of you have, mostly the men for some reason. Um, <laughs> but now the new Met Stadium and Yankee Stadium and new construction has twice as many stalls uh, for women than it does for men. Those things really affect our lives when we do them. Getting results when we have complaints would make us feel empowered, assertive, and effective. And all the books in the magazine that say, feel empowered, well, they're getting something very wrong because personal empowerment is not about a feeling. It's about having actual influence in your relationships, in your life. If you don't, but you just feel empowered, you won't feel empowered for long, I assure you. But Voicing meaningful dissatisfactions when you have them, getting the people around you to change what they're doing, or your community to change what you're doing, that's the definition of personal empowerment. In other words, we have to stop managing our complaints in ways that are emotionally harmful to us, and use them as psychological tools that could make us stronger. It's like Popeye and spinach, really. I'm sure you all know uh, Popeye the Sailor. He was even a Google Doodle in December of 2009. Are you familiar with it? Okay, so for those who aren't up on your depression era cartoons, Popeye is a pipe smoking sailor who gets strong by eating spinach, mostly from a can, so that's disgusting, but really the, the spinach. So, well, complaints are like spinach. They could make us all stronger if we use them correctly. But we don't. It's as if Popeye, instead of eating the spinach, just stuffed it into his pipe, smoked it, and got emphysema. And then thought, well, complaints are bad. No, how we use them is bad. So let's discuss how to use complaints correctly. How to eat the spinach rather than smoke it. How to complain effectively, how to get results, and improve our quality of life. Now, to be able to complain effectively, we have to master a fundamental problem. We have to get our complaint through the other person's defense mechanisms. Pause. Think back to the last time you got home at night and your significant other turned to you and said, we have to talk. I'm assuming there went your mood for the evening. Because you immediately felt, felt, uh, felt defensive, like you were going to be attacked. That's how we feel about complaints, like we're going to be attacked. And so what it does is it triggers the fight or flight response set when we even sniff a complaint coming our way. We either want to raise the drawbridge, flood the moat, and release the crocodiles, or we want to escape the situation as rapidly as possible. For our complaint to be effective, we have to voice it in a way that's least likely to trigger the other person's defensive, uh, or at least trigger them on their lowest possible setting. The problem is that our urge to complain is at its all-time strongest when we are at our most annoyed. But the angrier we sound, the more defensive the other person gets, and the less able they will be to take in our complaint. And there is our complaining predicament. Our defensiveness, and their anger means we'll get an ineffective result 
and someone ends up sleeping on the couch. Now, to illustrate these dynamics and the solutions to them, I'm going to give you three common examples of complaints I hear all the time, both in my office from patients and from friends. I chose common ones that you should be able to relate to. I'm going to read you three scenarios, and I want you to imagine yourself in these scenarios. Here's scenario number one. You're waiting for your significant other at the movie theater. You've been dying to see the new movie everyone is talking about, but you've already missed the first 10 minutes of the film because your honey, as usual, is late. Now, let's randomly assign genders to these scenarios just for illustration purposes, and let's just randomly say the significant other in this scenario is a woman, just randomly. <laughs> scenario two. Your significant other has been working around the clock, and you finally have a free night together to enjoy a romantic dinner. But you haven't been able to complete one train of thought because every few seconds your honey glances over at the Android or smartphone to check or respond to emails. Now let's randomly say the significant other in this scenario is a man. Again, randomly. And lastly, scenario three, you went to major trouble for your significant other's birthday and you threw them a surprise party with all their friends. You wake up on your birthday all excited to find a gift certificate on the kitchen counter with a post-it saying, happy birthday, honey. Now, this one I typically hear from both genders. Let's take a quick vote. Who says the significant other is a woman in this one? Well, it's an easy vote. A man? Yeah, okay. So, um, <laughs> apparently men are really bad gift givers. Um, okay, so now we have our scenarios, chronic lateness, smartphone attached like a Siamese twin, and a birthday reciprocity failure. Now, I'm going to give you some quotes of how actual people I know complain. This is their actual complaint. These are quotes, what they said in these situations. Here is the lateness situation. About flipping time, the movie started 10 minutes ago. I am sick and tired of you being late all the time. I'm tired of it. As you know, I practice in New York, so yes, I did paraphrase one of those words. Scenario two, the smartphone. I swear, if you don't put that bleeping phone away right now, I will break it into a thousand pieces and shove them down your throat. Yes, she's a delicate flower, that one, she. <laughs> and scenario three, the gift. You're giving me a gift certificate for my birthday. Are you kidding me? You gave your five-year-old nephew a gift certificate for his birthday, and you think he's a spoiled brat. So, you might have every right to feel furious or frustrated or hurt in these situations. But the question is, are those complaints effective? No. Does raising our voice or losing our temper motivate the other person to take responsibility? No. Do curses and threats compel people to think through their behavior, see the error of their ways, and vow to change? No. If we want the other person to hear us, to respond, to change, we have to forego the brief, albeit sweet, satisfaction of telling them off, of scoring points, of winning the argument, and go for the far deeper and longer lasting satisfaction of getting a meaningful result. Sad as it is, we cannot do both. The only way to get the other person to hear us, to digest what we're saying is to make our complaint as delicious as possible by using the complaint sandwich. The complaint sandwich is a simple technique that makes any complaint more effective. It involves sandwiching the meat, our actual complaint, between two positive statements, the bread. And that does three things. It prevents the complaint recipient from becoming too defensive, it focuses the attention of the other person on our actual complaint as opposed to on our anger or our attitude. And it increases the likelihood the complaint recipient will respond positively. Now, the structure of the complaint sandwich is three elements. It's simple, but the details are not. So let's look at them. The first slice of bread, the positive statement, I call the ear opener. And its purpose is to do just that to keep the ears of the complaint recipient open to our actual complaint 
to follow. But coming up with a positive statement in some of these situations is trickier than it seems. When I do this in my office with some patients, let's say there's a husband who's annoyed with his wife about something with the kids, and I say, give it a try, and he goes, that's no problem. Um, uh, uh, nice blouse. No, no. Uh, unless his complaint is about her clothing, no. So let's look at what the era openers would be for our three situations. Here is the lateness situation. Honey, I know you make an effort to be on time. Now, some of you might think, she's always late. How is that something we can say? Well, people who are always late are actually trying to be on time. They're constantly rushed and trying. They're trying to be on time. They're just horrible at it. So we can say, you made an effort. Terrible, but you made an effort. So here's a second scenario, the phone. Babe, I know how hard it is to have a job where they expect you to respond to emails after hours, because most people who have those jobs would rather not, so we can easily say that. And in the gift scenario, I know I'm not easy to shop for, especially on birthdays and holidays, and really, most adults aren't easy to shop for, because if we want something, we get it for ourselves, so it's not, we can always say that, I think that's an easy one. Now, the meat of the complaint sandwich is our actual complaint. And here, the idea, the meat should be lean. We don't want to marinate our meat in sarcasm or anger. That doesn't do any good. And we want to stick to only one specific incident. Now, yes, it's terribly tempting to point out all the other times the person was late, all the dinners that were ruined because of the smartphone, every birthday and holiday in which the gifts were inappropriate, starting with the Christmas debacle of 2003, when, but it's not useful. All that does is overwhelm the other person, and then they get defensive and they stop listening because they're busy planning their rebuttal, and they're busy, that's what they're doing, and they're busy thinking of a counterattack, and they're busy wondering why they're with us in the first place, and do we realize our face looks funny when we get that angry, so it's not useful. <laughs> so let's look at what the meets would be for our complaint situations. Here's the lateness situation. Waiting for you made me really tense and irritable because I don't know how late you'll be. I can't just switch these feelings off when you arrive, so then I can't enjoy what we're doing. And here you'll notice it's all I statements. It's about explaining to the other person, here's what goes wrong for me. Not you're late or you're inconsiderate. Here's what happens. The second scenario is the phones. Unfortunately, it's impossible for me to relax have a conversation and enjoy your company when you're checking your phone every few minutes. It's just too disruptive. Again, these are I statements. And in the third, a gift card doesn't require much thought or effort, so regardless of what's in it or where it's from, it just feels impersonal and disappointing. So it's a complaint, but it's an explanation as well. The last slice of bread is a positive statement I call the digestive. And that is that spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. It also provides incentive for the other person to respond positively because it should make it clear to them what they can do to rectify the situation. When we get a complaint and we know, oh, we can do this and things will be better, it's so much easier to just do this than when somebody's just really upset and we're not sure what we can do about it. So, and when people ask me for complaining advice, I say, well, what's the scenario? And they tell me. And I say, well, what is it you want to achieve? And they always look at me and they go, oh, they're not sure. And the idea is, think it through. Because once you know what you actually want to achieve, it'll really help direct you in terms of how you complain, to whom you complain. It's very useful. Let's look at the digesters for our scenarios. Here's the lateness one. If you can promise to be on time when you know something is important to me, I'll promise to really appreciate it because I'll know it took a huge effort. Now, it's hard to get a late person to be on time, but that works so much better than the threats and the anger. That motivates them at least to try. The second scenario with the phones. If we agreed to turn off our phones when we're having dinner or talking about something important, it would allow me to enjoy our time together so much more. And some people say to me, well, I can't just be off for an hour, you know, I work for this uh, investment bank or whatever. And I say, fine, take five minutes in the middle of the dinner, turn the phone on, check, respond, and turn it off again, but spend 55 minutes with the other person. And the last scenario is, um, there we go. I know you worry about getting me the wrong thing, but I promise if it's obvious you put thought into a gift, I'll always be pleased.
which is a nice way to say it. Now, when I work with couples and they start using the complaint sandwich with one another, all of their arguments get easier because the minute they see somebody like racking their brain and starting with this ear opener thing, the other person starts smiling and say, oh, you're going to serve me a complaint sandwich? Well, yes, I am. And there's much less tension. And then they're actually discussing things. It's really useful. It's like shorthand for let's not argue, but. And it's, it's really great. Now, complaining in a relationship is a two-way street. So I also want to tell you how to eat a complaint sandwich, or really how to respond to a complaint, whether it's served to you as a sandwich or not. One, uh, when it comes to being on the receiving end of a complaint, one of the most common mistakes people make, and by people I mean men, <laughs> is to interrupt the other person with an explanation or a solution or an apology before they finish speaking. Familiar? Is it? It should be. Now, all that does is frustrate the other person more because from their perspective, until they finish telling you why they're upset, any solution or any apology you make doesn't seem authentic because you don't yet know what you're apologizing for. So principle number one, do not interrupt the initial complaint, however long it takes. If I can do that with my mother, you can do that with other people because she, she goes on forever. Um, <laughs> the other thing is verify you understand exactly why the other person is upset. One of the most common things that happen is that one person is complaining about X, and the other com person is complaining about Y, and so they're actually not talking about exactly the same thing. And then they both feel unheard, and they start to repeat themselves. I'm sure you've had these arguments where you're saying the same thing, then they're saying the same thing. You can script their next response. You're going around, around, nothing really is happening, but you keep at it for some reason. That happens because you're not exactly talking about the same thing. For example, in the birthday gift uh, scenario, if the person just said, I'm really annoyed about the gift, then you might think, oh, because I left it on the counter and didn't give it to her in person, or because there wasn't a card, or because maybe that wasn't the right store, or maybe I exceeded the budget we had agreed on. You can come up with five different scenarios of why they might be upset. So one thing I suggest is when the other person's upset, verify you understand exactly what it's about. You can say, I just want to understand, to make sure I understand exactly why you're upset. Is it this? And by the way, that sentence alone relationship gold. Trust me, it really reassures the other person you're trying to understand. So do that. And the last thing is acknowledge the other person's feelings. You might not feel it's your fault. Uh, you might feel that they're in the wrong. But it doesn't cost you anything to just acknowledge how they feel. You know, you're not taking responsibility by doing that. You're not ceding any ground. You can certainly say, honey, I can imagine how furious you were that I was 30 minutes late to a movie you wanted to see so badly, and then say, but your email said 8 o'clock, not 7.30. So understanding their feelings and conveying that doesn't cost you anything. Being on the receiving end of complaints is not easy for anyone, but it is perhaps hardest of all for call center representatives, the people who answer the phone when we call a customer service or a technical support or a sales hotline, because they get yelled at for a living. Now, Google began offering free phone support for its AdWords customers in North America, I think in April. And I haven't spoken to any of those people, but if their jobs are anything like those in other call centers, then they're dealing with a huge amount of customer hostility. How much? Studies show that call center representatives can deal with an average of 10 hostile calls a day. And I want to be clear what I mean when I say hostile. We're talking curses, yelling, put downs, insults, ridicule, personal threats, and even death threats. Truly. Now, think about it for a moment. I mean, really ask yourselves, have you ever called a customer hotline and raised your voice? Most of us have, you know? And you might be nice people. Think about the not nice people who do it. Now, we wouldn't speak that way to anyone else in our lives. But when it comes to call center employees, it's open season. And part of the reason is because of the systems that some companies, not all, but some companies put in place really annoying systems. It starts with the automated menus. They ask for your account number, your social security number, 
your date of birth, they want to know your mother's maiden name, the name of your first pet, the serial number of the washing machine that's on the bottom of the machine, but it's bolted to your basement floor. <laughs> then you finally get through to a recording who tells you, without a shred of irony, that your time is really valuable to the company who's very busy wasting it. And then you finally get to a live person, and they have a foreign accent. Isn't that annoying? Okay. So, and that person then just proceeds to ask you all the same questions all over again while mispronouncing your name. Now, my name is simple. Guy and Winch. It's one syllable apiece. And yet, here's some of the things that I get. How can I help you, Mr. Wank? <laughs> yes, Mr. Witch. And my favorite, let me bring up your account, Mr. Wench. Can I call you gay? <laughs> so we were annoyed before we even called, let alone after that obstacle course. The thing is, many companies have things in place which they call planned inconvenience. And their idea is to make it that difficult for customers to get through so customers will drop out. Here's the genius. They then have to hire fewer call center representatives and great, they're saving money, except that when people actually do get through, they have so much more anger and hostility which they unleash on those call center representatives that the call center representatives can't take it. And they end up leaving after a few months or a year. Call center work has, is one of the most stressful jobs there are, and it, wa and it has one of the highest dropout rates of any industry. People just can't take it. It affects their mental health, it affects their physical health, and so they leave. And what happens then is those companies might have saved money on the reps, but now they have to invest money in hiring new people, in training new people, and then guess what? Those new people are less experienced, so they don't know what they're doing. So we get even angrier, so they leave even sooner, and on and on the vicious cycle goes. Nobody wins. Now, while our anger might be justified, the people we're calling are entry-level employees with limited authority. And civility and respect will elicit far more help and effort on their part than yelling and cursing. I sometimes, when I'm really annoyed, will say, I'm glad to speak with you. I'm sorry if I sound annoyed. I'm just really frustrated, and I hope you can help me. But it's really not at you, so please don't take it personally. And that disclaimer alone, they go, oh, great. And they're much, they're much happier about it. The thing is, what do companies do to help call center employees manage the stress? They tell them in their brief week or so of training, oh, we're going to give you techniques to manage stress. Here's technique number one. You can ask the customer to stop yelling. <laughs> I was glad we went for that one. And here's another technique. They say, write down the number of curses, because most customers only have seven juicy curses in them. You know, I mean, that's like saying to a boxer, let your opponent keep hitting you in the face, because eventually they'll get exhausted. In other words, most companies do very, very little to help their call center employees. The problem is the companies don't understand complaining psychology. If they taught complaining psychology to call center reps, it would help them because A, they'd understand where the customers are coming from, and it would help them know how exactly to diffuse the anger. But companies, even the executives don't understand. They don't understand that complaints are like gold to them. Companies spend tens of thousands of dollars on focus groups. And complaints are free focus groups. They're telling you about problems with your products or your procedures or your services, which you can just fix and avoid other problems and avoid customers complaining or leaving or spreading bad word about you. But they don't do it. The tragedy of our complaining psychology is that most people know so little about it, everyone loses. Our relationships suffer because we don't know how to voice our satisfactions without starting an argument. Our self-esteem suffers because we feel powerless to get results. Call center employees suffer, customers lose, and companies lose. The good news is we can start turning that around right now and make a difference in our own lives and our own communities because there are only three things required to have an impact for you, for anyone. We need complaining savvy, which now you have a little bit of, persistence, and a belief that your complaint is right. Sometimes only a few people can make a difference in a community. And sometimes it only takes one person. 
And just to illustrate that point of how much of a difference one person can make, I'm going to tell you about Becky Williams and her extra-large brassiere. Miss Williams' story began in the fall of 2007, when as a 25-year-old copywriter for children's books in England, she was shopping for brassieres in Marks and Spencer, which I don't know if you know, it's one of the largest retailers in all of uh, England. And she noticed something strange. Bras that were sized double D and larger had a two pound surcharge, that's three dollars and changed. And being in the and larger category herself, she was a little annoyed by the pricing discrepancy, so she got home and dashed off a letter to Marks and Spencer saying, um, why am I paying more for my bras? And they wrote back saying, well, it's to defray the costs of extra material the extra large bras require. And she thought, well, my blouses have extra material and I don't pay more for those, so that didn't make sense to her. So she wrote back to Marks and Spencer to point out all the flaws in their logic and didn't hear from them. Marks and Spencer didn't respond. So she was discussing this issue with some of her busty friends, as she calls them, when she realized she really doesn't like complaining without doing something, so she decided she's going to do something. So she started a Facebook group to petition Marks and Spencer about their pricing discrepancy, and she called the group Busts for Justice. Busts for Justice immediately swelled with over 100 new members, so much so that a journalist in London saw the group and decided to write a small story about it in a London newspaper in which Becky Williams appeared outside Marks and Spencer's with one of her brassiers. In the week following that national exposure, the Busts for Justice Facebook group ballooned to huge proportions with over 8,000 new participants. And, and we're counting people, by the way, as participants, um, who all started writing the company. And Mark Spencer thought, uh, we'll issue a statement. And what their statement said was, very few companies make those kinds of extra large brassiers. Those ladies should be grateful. We are not willing to jiggle our price one bit, which was slightly short-sighted on their uh, part. So the discussion boards, when that happened on Bus for Justice, heaved with activity, and Marks and Spencer realized, uh, oops, so they called Becky Williams up for a meeting in which they said to her, we're going to discuss pricing options with our manufacturers in China. Great. But then the recession of 2008 hit, and in Great Britain as well, and Marks and Spencer said, well, in this economic climate, there's nothing we can do. And they stopped returning her calls. Now, you might think, well, what more can she do, this 25-year-old, right? But Becky Williams had complaining savvy, and she had persistence, and she really believed she was right. So here's what she did. In May of 2009, she went out and bought one share of Marks and Spencer stock for roughly $5. And then she called the journalist that put the, uh, the, the story in the London paper and told her that she and some of her busty friends will be attending the annual stockholders uh, meeting of Marks and Spencer in July, where they will personally confront in person the chair of the company about their discriminatory pricing policies. And the journalist knew a good story when she heard it, and by the next morning, Becky Williams was on her way to London to tape a segment in a very popular breakfast television show in which she described the upcoming confrontation. 48 hours later, Marks and Spencer folded. They not only agreed to price all bras equally, they actually issued an apology to Becky Williams and her Facebook group. Now, being a British company, they absolutely had to insert the obligatory pun, so the apology was, we boobed. <laughs> but finally, taking advantage of the amazing marketing opportunity that had been staring them in the face all along, they announced a one-week bra sale to usher in this new era of uh, bra size equality. Becky Williams started out by writing a letter about a biased 
pricing policy and ended up creating change on a national level that affected tens of thousands of women. And what's remarkable is she did all of it without lawyers, without financing, without candlelit marches. She only used three things we all have, complaining savvy, persistence, and a belief she was right. Complaints can be powerful things. If we use them correctly, they can truly be our spinach. They can get us results when we've been wronged. They can get our relationships back on track when they've derailed. They can improve our communities, and they can help us feel stronger and better about ourselves. Complaints can help companies serve their customers better by improving their products and their services and becoming more profitable by doing that. Life presents us with challenges and dissatisfactions every single day. The next time you find yourself venting to someone who can't fix the problem instead of to someone who can, remember that the door to your own psychological revolution could start with that very complaint. If instead of just squeaking, you squeaked effectively. Thank you very much. So I think we're doing a Q&A. Uh, I'll take the A's. Um, any Q's? Uh, thank you very much, Fabio. Uh, I have a for your talk. First of all, did you take a, an actor class some, sometime? I'm sorry? Did you take an actor class sometime? A, a what class? A lecture class? Actor. Actor class? No. I, I did not. Why? Okay. I, I'm sorry. No. Oh, that's okay. That's that, the second question is, uh, <laughs> I think the fun, uh, you haven't uh, like really described the fundamental problem behind the lack of complaining is that people afraid to confront other people, and those five percent who do complain, they don't afraid to confront other people in general. So in how can people? How can people like raise their ability to confront okay. others? That's a very good question, but there, there are two aspects there. First of all, many of our complaints are not going to be in-person confrontations. We can write letters that's not very confrontative. But the whole idea, for example, of the complaint sandwich is that it doesn't feel like a confrontation when you do it that way. It doesn't feel like it to you as a complainer, and it doesn't feel like it to the other person. It feels much more like a pleasant transaction. The whole idea of the confrontation is that we wait and then we bring so much anger to the complaining situation because of our psychology that it turns into a confrontation. But my point is exactly that's the wrong approach. We should just voice things, do it pleasantly, start positively, and it feels much less like a confrontation and much easier for most of us to do because most of us don't enjoy confrontations. But that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hi. Do you have any recommendations on how to change the way people complain to you that aren't someone like your partner that you can work constructively with? Yes. So like strangers on the street in New York, for example, that Ooh. seem to want to put their anger and frustration onto me, I'm for example. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're doing to the people when you're walking down the street. <laughs> I <laughs> well, the strangers in the street in New York, just specifically, it might be better to just keep walking. But um, so yes, I'll, give you a, I'll give you an example. Um, so I was hiking a few weekends ago and stopped at a restaurant after my hike and with my friend and to have a beer and whatever snack. Um, and we were stretching on the porch mm -hmm. um, by our table while we were waiting for our food, um, and you know then sat down when our food arrived and had a pleasant meal. And when we left, the guy sitting next to us said under his breath, but loud enough so we could hear it, thank God they're leaving, get a gym next time. <laughs> um, you know, I just kept walking, but it's, it, this seems to happen to me all the time for some reason, I don't know why. And, and I can't really exactly say, go back to him and say, hey, can you give that to me in a complaint sandwich next time? Well, no, but look, first of all, I'm not sure where else you're stretching. But other than that, <laughs> But here's what you can say. I mean, I would turn to the person and say, you know, if that really bothered you, all you had to do was say something. Hmm. Do you, in other words, I'm, yeah. I'm really, since I wrote my book, I've become horribly annoying. Because I will actually, <laughs> no, it's true, I'll actually educate people about when they complain to me, I'll give them pointers. I'm like, oh, you know what? <laughs> 
your, your angle was okay, but here's what you should really try. <laughs> and they're like, what? And I'm like, you see, you started by telling me that I'm a douchebag. But if, in fact, you started with a why and then gave me the douchebag, I would have listened more. I mean, I'll, so I'm, it's very annoying, but I'll do yeah. it. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank Thanks. you. Any other stretches? Wanna? <laughs> Yeah. Um, don't you agree that there's just a certain segment of the population that it complains for no reason? They don't want results. It's just a way of whining or attention grabbing. And what are your thoughts on that? Okay. Absolutely. We, there are chronic complainers. I talk about them in my book. I didn't really have time to address them here. But the, there are chronic complainers. They're not a majority. But there are people who really, they're dissatisfied with everything. It has much more to do with how they perceive the world because they don't see themselves as complaining. They just see their lives as very bleak and they're responding to it accurately. But they don't want to hear solutions. They don't want to be cheered up. They just want to be validated like, yes, things are so terrible for you. <laughs> that's, that's what makes them happy. If you try and tell them things are not so terrible, they're not going to be happy. But if you go, oh, that's just terrible, you'll see the it's just so pleased. And, and <laughs> maybe you know those people. And, and the thing is, yes, some people, and they're going to complain. It's going to be very, very hard to change them. But there are not that many of them. But they usually, there's one or two around everywhere. And, and um, once you know it, you can just steer clear by just going, oh, yes, that's terrible. And, you know, keep walking. And, uh, and not, you know, get into trying to, oh, but it's really not that bad. Because that just will, they'll tell you why it is. And it, it'll just go on forever. But yes, there are people like that. Hey, uh, this actually happened like uh, last week. Uh, so uh, I, I was in a taxi and um, I, that was like very early in the morning and um, I asked the taxi driver to take me to a place and he charged me like excessively extra. Uh, so I asked him to take to a certain place and then I changed the direction and I told him to go to another place and then he just doubled the price. What do you mean? The, the, there was a price on the meter and he just... No, it's not on the meter. He, I, he initially told me it was like $30 or something uh -huh. and then later he said 65 So, uh, and then I tried arguing with him and then he started yelling at me. So that was the position where uh, I, I just couldn't help but then budge to him uh, saying that, okay, yeah, I just whatever be it, I'll, I'll just pay, pay and leave. And ever since that, like, I, I've complained to three other people after that about the same situation. <laughs> I, I, like, I, there was no other go but to complain about it. So how would you uh, deal with such situations? Look, I'll tell you what I would do in that situation. I mean, but New York Cabs, that's just another book, isn't it? But, um, but I would just say to him, look, I can give you the extra money you want, and I'll be writing a letter to the TLC with all your information, or I can give you the money we agreed upon in the first place, plus a nice tip. It's your choice. You tell me what you want. I think that's the best you can do in those kinds of scenarios. Do you know what the TLC is? It's the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Mm. There's usually a number posted in, in cabs and livery cabs that, that you, you can, they have a number for complaints. I never call it. I don't know how responsive they are. But yes, you can, I would offer the option. Yeah, so um, I was basically considering that option, but then I just didn't go ahead and do it. <laughs> but I think if you had, for example, you would have felt better about it. Yeah. Hi, so uh, I'm one of these people that never complains at restaurants, right? Um, and I think, I, I, I've been thinking about it while you've been talking, and you know, um, sending your food back is a huge hassle, and it disrupts your meal. You don't really want to do that. Uh, you don't, I don't want to be perceived as saying, like, hey, how about a round of free drinks or, you know, give me something. And I'm trying to think of, like, what the second slice of bread is in the sandwich if I were to say, excuse me, or, you know, oh, everything is really great, but my steak is slightly underdone, and I don't quite know what I want from you. I just want you to know that I'm unhappy. And like, I'm not, <laughs> so, so I wonder what your recommendation is for that second slice of bread. You need to figure out what you want. I mean, and, I mean, this is what I was saying, because when you don't, A, you do get stuck, and B, if you don't know, what's the manager going to do? I mean, multiple choice, do you know what I mean? They have to guess. The thing is, in restaurants, here's the thing. If something bothers you to the extent that you might not go back to that restaurant, you're losing out and the restaurant is losing out. So why I believe in sending things back in certain restaurants, you know, not at McDonald's, like, I don't like the fries, but in, <laughs> but in restaurants, why I believe that's important is because they will do something for you because they want you to come back. 
And if that's going to allow you to come back, you know, um, then I think you should do it. Now, usually when you return something, they, they, they um, expedite the order. They don't make you wait the other, you know, I mean, unless you want another well-done steak, that might take a while. But I think it's important to give the restaurant an opportunity to rectify the situation. And then your uh, digestive would be, because I really like this restaurant and I come here a lot and I'd like to keep coming here, for example. But you do have to figure out what, what you want, unfortunately. So you spoke a lot about how to deal with um, like companies when complaining or specifically in like um, interpersonal relationships. And maybe this falls into the interpersonal relationship category, but when, do you have any special advice for the coworker scenario? This may be different than someone you're rom romantically involved with or a company or something. I don't, know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there sure. as many specific complaints <laughs> you're thinking? <laughs> um, By the way, I mean, is, are your colleagues? In, well, uh, I mean, um, so actually it's, it's really convenient because um, the guy that I m uh, was used to complain about a lot to my wife instead of to him um, has actually quit. So it's, he's, yeah, it's perfect. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, Does I he mean, get YouTube? I don't know. All right. No, but, all right, it, anyway. right. So, but at any rate, um, it was just essentially like uh, low, low performance, low quality of, of work and, and just feeling like no matter how many times we would talk about how things could be better or different, they weren't. How did that impact you? Well, because it made more work for me or like I okay. had to clean I understand. up more and stuff like that. So look, so I do actually think it's important. I mean, at work, when you're complaining in parallel, when you're complaining to, to colleagues or coworkers, I think it's important to voice it. And you can say like, I, I really think you're making a, you know, a big effort here, or I really enjoy sharing the office with you, or whatever the, the opener would be. I really feel that in some cases, you're not doing enough and I'm carrying a little bit more of the load. So I'm wondering if we can discuss how to take our next project and give you a bigger slice of it to even that out a little bit. Something like that. Okay, so it's still just another sandwich. It's always, <laughs> it's always a sandwich. <laughs> All right, cool. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. It's been entertaining. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask if you have any advice about uh, choosing your complaining battles. <laughs> um, mm. So if my husband says I complain about too many things, it sort of then falls on deaf ears, even if it's in a complaint sandwich. Is there, do you have some advice about what to complain about <laughs> versus yes. not? Yes, that's a really, really important question, so I'm really glad you asked it. Um, we really have to think this through in our relationships because you want, in general, 80% of what you say to your husband to be either neutral or positive, and 20% to be either directives or complaints. Directives would be, honey, come to dinner, uh, or, or complaints. No, I mean, that's, that's part of the thing. So you can't have it be too negative. Even if they're actually doing things which warrant 50% complaining, you really have to choose. You want the overall tone of your communications to be as positive as possible. So A, you have to choose and prioritize, and B, you have to order them so that they're not too many coming at him at once. You want to sit down and have him take one complaint seriously, fix that, and then voice another serious complaint after that, rather than just fire them off when you get home, and then he just turns off and he's not listening to them anymore. So yes, it's really important to prioritize. The ones which are most emotionally meaningful to you are the ones I would start with, but one, and make the general tone of your dialogue with him sound more positive before you do that, and then he'll be more opening to listen about your complaint, especially if you use the sandwich. So a follow-up to that is um, I've noticed in some communications with my husband, um, and I'm sure other people are familiar with this, that when someone complains about something, the other person says, well, you do that. Um, so they're sort of complaining back. First of all, when you try the sandwich, you'll find that happens much, much less. Uh -huh. Secondly, you can say, um, that's a great point. Since I'm the one that raised the thing I wanted to discuss, let's separate those two discussions. Let's have this one first, and I promise you I'll sit through the other one when we're done with this one. But let's do one thing at a time. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I just had a question um, regarding other people eating the complaint sandwich. Um, unfortunately, there are often people in your lives that don't like eating any sort of complaint sandwich or any sort of feedback. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're just difficult people and you have to interact with them. How can you soften or make them more accepting of a complaint sandwich when 
they are difficult people, for example. Well, in my book, I get into this a little bit, because in certain scenarios, you have to really fluff up that bread uh, more than in others. And so it could be that if someone's difficult and they're resistant, that first slice of bread needs to be extra fluffy. You know, and it could be that you need to explain things in the meat section much, much more so they understand it. Um, but essentially, yes, some people are just going to be very defensive, not many. But if you really work those elements of the sandwich correctly, and in the examples I gave, the bread was very, it's a half a sentence, a sentence. You can beef that up to three or four sentences of a preamble, and then put the meat in, and then add another three or four sentences in the digestive, and that will make it much easier for the other person to take in. It's not a guarantee. Some people just won't. But um, your best likelihood is to make the bread more extensive on either end. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. <laughs>